This is from the Jovian archive, and this is where all of the information that was compiled from all of Ra Uruhu's publications after receiving Human Design Prophecy. You can uh, you can explore human design in its entirety here um, and get a fundamental some fundamental concepts about it. But basically, these are all of the different gates. And this is an entire, I mean, this represents the entire cosmos, right? With the human being at the center of it all. And, you know, your natal chart can be found, it can be mapped, let's say, on this particular chart, which is kind of like, it's called a mandala chart. But also, as Pluto is the determining factor because of it being an outlier in our system, and it is, it's known as like the planet of transformations, as it, it, it will move like one degree over, like basically activating a different gate in Pluto at the time of each global shift. Cheers. I just got some more ESS60 from c60evo.com. This stuff is awesome. So what I like to do is I'll put a spoonful in my coffee in the morning when I get up and the energy levels and the clarity factor is exceptional. I also did some research about how powerful of an antioxidant ESS 60 is and there's nothing that even comes close folks. You can get yours directly through the link if you click the link in the video description box. It's c60evo.com slash leap project. You can even get it in pill form now. They've got an MCT coconut oil, avocado oil, as well as extra virgin olive oil. The extra virgin olive oil is their most potent. You can also get serums for your face. This is pretty cool. I'm going to try this. Look at this. Hair Renewal Duo. Oh, yeah. I'll let you know about that. This is their facial serum. It's dual activated. The stuff is great. Kristen loves this stuff also. If you don't like to take it in liquid form, you can also get it in pill form. How cool is that? Your pets are going to love it. Your cats, your dogs, we've got bacon flavor for them. And let me know what you think in the comment section. Use the code EVLP for an additional discount when you click that link. And let's get back to the podcast right now. Hello, Zen Gen Peak Stone. It's great to see you. We haven't talked in quite a while, and I am super excited for this opportunity. Now, first of all, folks, I want to jump in real quick before we get started and say we're going to talk about human design charts. I've had several emails saying, what the heck is this? Um, People that study astronomy and astrology and, and some of the different aspects of hermetics, and I find this fascinating, but what's really cool is neutrinos. Actually, they're not cool. They're kind of hot. But we're going to talk about neutrinos also and how this incorporates, because I know very little. And the founder of human design charts, um, I don't know if you necessarily, like, what's the connection with him and neutrinos? And thank you for being a guest on Leap Project. How the heck are you? Hey, Rex. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here on Leap Project again. And I'm really excited to talk about neutrinos. I am far from a quantum physicist. I'm just going to preface that. But we're going to dive into some of the fundamental aspects of how neutrinos, they're actually, they serve as the foundational proof of how and why not only human design works, but also astrology, which is a really basic tenet along with many other modalities throughout human history. And it, this is the, it all boils back down to the neutrino. This is where the origin story begins. And I'm, I'm really excited to talk about it with you today. Are you telling me the missing link of star charts and how they can be, if you meet a good astrologer, like they will tell you more about yourself than you knew about yourself. And then you're like, oh yeah, how'd you know that? It's spooky. So I've always wondered how that's a blueprint for reality in many aspects. You know what I mean? It just, it seems like the, the outlines can be very powerful. So you're saying that neutrinos are like the missing link here? This is amazing. I'm so glad that you brought that up. That specific question, like how? Like, why, right? Like, what is the reasoning behind all of these different projections and predictions that astrology has purported and posited 
for thousands of years. I mean, it is one of the oldest modalities and frameworks of understanding our universe in the quantum physicalities of it and everything and how it works, but it's never ever answered that question of how, you know? And I'm just saying anyone who's ever been a skeptic of astrology or something similar, I deeply empathize with that skepticism. And I mean, I personally, I was raised by atheists and agnostics in the 80s and 90s, all right? They taught me to worship at the altar of science and education and that only verifiable evidence should ever be spoken of as truth and that nothing should ever be taken at face value if it's redeemable only through like faith or even as a testimony of your personal experience. But I'm going to tell you that where I find myself now, based on everything that I have personally experienced and studied, that I'm kind of in this like weird transitional zone between these two points of views, right? I, I really don't believe anymore that they're mutually exclusive in and of themselves and that I believe that you can have a metaphysical experience that can't yet be corroborated by the scientific method but neutrinos is kind of a missing link here for us to dive into the reason why the what what Ra Uruhu called the mechanics of the Maya whenever he was describing human design. I so, want to write that down real quick. Uh, mechanics of what? Mechanics of the what? Mechanics of the Maya. Isn't that cool? That's why I wanted to write it down. Yeah, mechanics of the Maya. And that you uh, he is referencing as the neutrino. Well, he's referencing human design as a whole. Okay. And that neutrinos... Ultimately, what they can be comparable to is raw, unprocessed data. These are, I mean, they are so abundant in our field at all times. They are constantly streaming through us. They are like, you literally right now have 100 trillion neutrinos passing through your body at every given second. Three trillion neutrinos pass through every single square inch of planet Earth every single second. And this, I mean, look it up, yo. Like, look it up. This is actually, I mean, we're measuring this now. And in a minute here, I'm going to show you a really fascinating timeline in the history of neutrinos and not only how they were discovered, but like how we began to, it, we, we took it from this place of theory, right? That quantum physicists and scientists as a whole, we, they, they always begin there. A theory, a hypothesis, something is happening and maybe this is the reason why. And I'm going to write out projections that might support that. And I'm going to start to gather evidence that will get sh like shed some light. Excuse the pun. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect pun. Yeah, I mean, that is wild. That is absolutely incredible. There you go. All right. Do you want to do a screen share or, or are you just? Right. Yeah. Let's go there. Let's let's pull up this timeline of neutrinos and dive right in, shall we? We are going to zoom out, so to speak. And I, I love using the term zooming in and zooming out for microscopic and macroscopic perspectives, because honestly, Everything within the mechanics of the Maya, i.e. human design, human design is just a process and a modality to kind of take reflections and um, make, make different projections based on this information, right? It, it's a modality. Uh -huh. It's a tool to be used. But there, there is an actual process, a phenomena that's taking place. And it's all scalar in nature. Everything is a scalar rep, everything smaller. And I'm referring to both planetary bodies as well as human bodies, okay? As well as like DNA, it goes that small 
and it expands to include the the entire spectrum of everything in our known physical universe okay and so it began with that theory that's pretty cool yeah like it, it really does and it makes it simple you know whenever everything is a scalar representation of everything else it really starts to show the algorithm that's at play and just for the listeners that don't know what the word Maya actually means, like this is the word that literally means illusion. And for those who ascribe to the belief and how science is corroborating right now, as we speak, that we are living in a, you know, in, in a universe that is, um, it, there, there is a system at play right? There is something at play and it, it's it's not necessarily real, but it, it feels very real. It's perceived as real. And, you know, this is, this is how it's all broken down. And it, it starts with the neutrino. So Wolfgang Pauli, he was the first, he was the guy who he developed a hypothesis for the existence of this new particle. It's a fundamental excuse me, fundamental particle, meaning that it can't be further broken down into smaller parts, at least not yet that we can see. But at this point, it, he only developed a working theory. There was nothing in their, um, it, it, at their disposal that could confirm or deny it is actually existing. And the reason why he developed this working theory was because he he needed to explain as a as a theoretical physicist he needed to be able to explain the uh what happens in the process of beta decay um you know that at this time they're working on the Manhattan project the three theoretical physicists with Oppenheimer and that whole group you know they they are developing theories based on what they are projecting with mathematics and, you know, so this is this is very similar to whenever you or I have like a hunch or um, an intuition that kind of, you know, imbues us with something and we can't quite explain it yet, but we're doing our best <laughs> and but we don't necessarily have that evidence to back it up. But we is that any reason to not progress on a trajectory of exploring it further? I think not. And so after and after Wolfgang Pauli comes Enrico Fermi, also a member of the Manhattan Project, Italian American physicist, he further developed this working theory that had been proposed previously by Wolfgang Pauli. And so he developed it further to include it was an invisible particle emitted with an electron during beta decay. And but it was still a theory. It was theorized that subatomic particles were massless and chargeless. And he received a Nobel Prize for this work in 1938. And I believe there's still a um some kind of a an award that is awarded to scientists called the like the Fermi Award. Um, it you know, and this, that was all based on his work around neutrinos. It has me thinking about the Fermi paradox. Mm -hmm. Well, because he's the one that postulated why do we not see Dyson spheres around so many stars and so many extraterrestrial species and civilizations coming and visiting. So that's remarkable. That's interesting. They, I know that these guys were working in the realm of the invisible, you know, like they, they couldn't see any of this stuff and they certainly didn't have um, access to any of these instruments and technology that we have available to us today. But that didn't stop them from looking further, you know, and it didn't stop them from following their hunches that I believe all of us have as human beings, just in different realms and different walks of life and different fields of interest, you know? Absolutely. So cool. The so, article and the Fermi paradox. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And honestly, they thought it was more like that of a, um, I, I, let me, let me, Gosh, I, I get all the little particles mixed up in my head. I, I think that they thought that it was more like a photon 
where the photon has no mass. It has, you know, it, it, it's um, it's associated with radioactivity and light, but it has no mass at all. Like it, unlike the other particles, like the neutron and the proton, like these these don't. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm not a chemist. I'm not an astrophysicist of any kind, but they were assuming early on that it was massless. And that was the one part of their theory that was actually incorrect. Um, moving on, I mean, they they wanted to confirm that these actually existed, right? They didn't want to just like keep it a working theory. And so these guys, uh, Clyde L. Cohen and Frederick Raines, they eventually conducted the first experiment and it was very rudimentary it was like a tub of water and basically i'm not going to go into the specifics of it but they figured out a way that when neutrinos since they're passing through everything so abundantly right they figured out a way for um it to be detected by a different particle as it passed through and for it to record that and they received the nobel prize for this eventually though i believe one of these gentlemen was not able to receive it because he had passed before um that that was awarded and it was many years later um it was but they they created the first experiment that actually showed like the reaction that occurs that detected the neutrino and confirmed its existence. That was a big step. Nothing really happened between then and way later, except one dude. We're going to move into Ra Uru Hu here, formerly uh, Alan Krakauer. He was the guy who, I mean, honestly, he was an entrepreneur. Uh, honestly, he was a failed businessman in many ways. There was a lot about his life early in life that was, um, it felt like a failure. Like he, and he kind of just like threw it all to the wind and said, I'm moving to Ibiza and I'm just going to be a school teacher and, and live a very modest, you know, normal life. And that's when he had an encounter. He had an encounter with a very mysterious voice in the Jan in January of 1987. And 1987 is a very important year in taking into context all that has happened with the discovery of neutrinos. He was the first person to be given the framework for what he would introduce later as the human design system. For the first time, he published it in the, it's called the Black Book. This is actually not the first time he published his uh, his experience, his findings, everything that was shared with him during this mystical experience with the voice. He published a few times locally in Ibiza. Um, those publications are quite a bit harder to come by. But the, the Black Book was published in 1991. And he wouldn't hear news of confirmation of his testimony that neutrinos indeed did possess mass until 2011. And this is very important because neutrinos having mass is the fundamental foundation basis of the human design system. Without neutrinos having mass, that, that whole system falls apart. And so he lived a lot of his life kind of worried and concerned that he was sharing like complete hogwash with people that this was all just some weird fluke and you know maybe his mind made it up I mean he was he was suffering from doubt quite a bit until his son did inform him of the proof that science had found that this prerequisite for the validity of human design eventually was discovered before his death. So moving on, this guy here, he is a, uh, I believe, a nuclear physicist or a, a theoretical physicist from Japan. This is actually what confirmed that existence was the super Kamiokande experiment. And it, it's a lot 
there's a lot of similarities between the the water tank that these guys built and this one that these guys built, but it was not rudimentary. I'm going to show y'all a picture here in a second of what the Kamio Kondi experiment actually looked like. It, it's going to blow your mind here. And... There we go. So this is a far cry from a, a little water tank, right? In like the base, basement of a lab. This is, uh, gosh, I don't even know how many tons of water this thing processes in, in terms of it, it it's, it's held underground and it's enormous. But this was actually the the thing that was not only able to detect that neutrinos are passing through it, it did the same thing, but it confirmed that they had mass through additional experiments because they were realizing that only a fraction of the neutrinos were being detected. And how would that be? Well, what they found was that these neutrinos, they change over time. There's different flavors of these neutrinos that they're discovering more all the time. As of now, I think only a handful have been identified, but I, I really do feel that the process is unfolding for more to be discovered. And what's really interesting about this is that they can't change over time unless they have mass, unless they are bumping into things and affecting changes in those things and taking on change themselves as they move through the space-time continuum you see that's pretty cool i wonder how much radiation that guy was getting exposed to in that um chamber and when you look at the chamber i think it's all probably symmetrical because the the four lights above or the several lights above it kind of looks like it's it was uneven but I think that was just the way that the image was taken. I wonder if that's all symmetrical. And, and anyway, I'm just talking out loud, but wow, that's pretty cool. Was that like in a CERN or something underground? Was that a part of the CERN? I don't know if there's an association with CERN and the Kamiya Kondi experiment. That's actually a really good question. Look it up real quick. How do you spell it? It's K-A-M-I-O-K-A-N-D-E. Kamio Kondi, and I might be saying that wrong. The hyper Kamio Kondi experiment, home CERN construction will start April 2020. The, listen to this. Whoa! See, that's what I like about um, having you on the program. You you bring up new stuff to me that I didn't really know about before. So this is what I found here. Um, I think it's connected to the detector. Da, 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 da. The reason I clicked on this is because I typed this in here. As you can see. And then the first link that came up. Oh, wow. was right there. <laughs> we'll start April 2020. An experiment is planned at CERN <gasps> to test crucial hardware. And then that's that 26 page. Um, so we could probably look at this. I mean, I don't it says it says data is expected to be taken in 2027. Did yeah. I read that right? Yes. Yeah. That's what it says. Oh, that yeah. is a really important year in the human design prophecy. Really? Um, it is. It, it absolutely is. That is the shift of global cycles year. We have been in the global cycle of planning for the last 400 years and it shifts in the year 2027. Wow, okay. So there could be a connection there with CERN. It very likely is. I mean, you just uncovered that here now in real time with us. I'm very intrigued to see how that unfolds. Wow. Well, and let me share this with you for a visual here. This is pretty cool. You're talking about neutrinos. So this shows the neutrino and then the way the, you know, the nucleus, the muon, electrons, all this stuff that I'm sure everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, <laughs> no, no, this is pretty, this is pretty new to me, but I find this fascinating. And I'm sure there are people out there that, that know a lot about the scientifics of this and you know a lot more than I do. So this is basically describing in detail what you're talking about, which I think is really freaking cool, man. This is pretty cool. 
So please it's continue. It's amazing. Yeah, please continue. No, it, it's, it's absolutely mind boggling how it all fits together, Rex. And you're, you're just like showing everyone exactly how that, that occurs. It, it happens all the time. Everything interlocks together in this seamless sequence of taking place because it, it really is all connected. And I know that a lot of people have heard that mentioned in you know the spiritual and the woo communities. We're all one. We're all interconnected. But like I said, I mean, I, I really want to, to have some evidence that supports this. And neutrinos is the, it's like the first stepping stone, so to speak. It's the so let let's look let's talk about what neutrinos actually are. Now, now just, yeah, and just real quick, this is the hyper cameo condi experiment, the hyper K, the one you referred to was didn't have hyper before it, right? Like that was the pre-experiment to this. I'm wondering if that's the case. The one I'm referring to said super Kamio Kondi. I don't know if they've like given a, a like a, a 2.0 version to, it's, you know, like yeah. identified as hyper in this case, but you can see that it's it's progressing with time and they're no, discovering no, more different. and more. There's the super and the hyper. Yeah, they're they're totally different. The super Kamio Kondi pre-supernova alarm and combined monitoring. <laughs> this is August 31st, 2023. Wow. And this is in Japan. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. 54 institutions, 236 members. So um, this is what you were referring to at first. And then we went on and then I looked something up and it took me to the hyper Kamio Kondi. I gotcha. So the hyper is not, is that one located in Japan as well? That's the one that CERN's working on and it'll be completed by 2027. Um, this is the one that's in Japan right here. Yes. The super. Okay. Gotcha. The Kamioka so, in Japan. It's been in operation since 1996. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that was when the scientific community had the consensus that, okay, neutrinos do have mass, um, which is, is not what they had presupposed for decades earlier. Ra Uruhu, the founder of human design, was the first to publish that neutrinos have mass and they do indeed interact with the bodies that they are passing through as, as they go through. Not necessarily all of the neutrinos, all trillions of neutrinos are not affecting you as they pass through, but certain ones do bump into your energy body, your physical body, as they are moving through e the ether, right? And and that's really important because, you know, the, this is raw data. It's raw data from the cosmos. And it's, it's really, um, <laughs> it's, Ra Uruhu called it, the neutrino stream is an ocean of unprocessed data. And I, I really love to take all of this information and really visualize what that means. I mean, this is a stream that has been flowing through our atmosphere, the atmosphere like all over the world, through your body. It's actually going through your body and then moving through the earth. And it's it's doing so at fantastic speeds. And then whatever is changed by this neutrino as it moves through you or someone else, it it takes that with it through the space-time continuum to continue interacting with other bodies. And so you can see why this was the basis of the human design system having validity. And the way in which it applies to astrology, Rex, is really interesting because, like I said, everything is scalar. We have human bodies and we have astral bodies, right? What are these bodies and what is their, um, their, their influence? What is their impact? What is their significance is that like they act as filters. We act as filters for these neutrinos, this unprocessed data to pass through and it changes us. There's something changed by there's something changed by the neutrino, the data that comes through us. There's something changed in the neutrino as it passes through the filter of us. And this is where we get 
the reason why the planets are affecting us in the ways that they do, that astrology has posited for thousands of years. So I know that you just had a birthday and you being a Leo, the um, the planets are at the earth is in a specific placement in relation to the sun at the time of, you know, August, at the time of Leo, right? And so that gives a very different flavor to the neutrino stream that is coming through all the time at the time that you, a human being, is born into this world. When And human design is interesting and different from astrology in that it takes into consideration not just your birth date, but also your design date. Because a human being is created, so to speak, before they're actually born, right? We have a human body that's formed in the womb. Human design takes this into consideration. And a lot of it is based upon a, a prophecy, a testimony that Ra received from this mysterious voice. But it is absolutely phenomenal, the, um, the validity and the illumination that it adds to people's lives whenever they start considering their design date versus their birth date, their unconscious aspect of what builds their body, who they are in the unconscious and who they are in the external world, in the conscious realm. And, and this is how, how it ties all together with neutrinos. Neutrinos set the stage for who it is you're going to be, both in how you're built and what the neutrino stream looks like at the time that you first enter into this world. That's pretty cool. And it also has me thinking about if we go into the simulation theory. And when I use the term simulation, that's just a doesn't mean it's not real. I'm referring to it as a model. It's certainly real, but it has an aspect of illusion. And so when people dream, one person might say, oh, it's just a dream. It's not real. And the other person might say, oh, it's very real. It's just a dream. It's a dream, um, but it's real. So when we look into that and we take these, shit, where the hell was I going with that? Uh, <laughs> I had a really, I was like right there. And then boom. Um, okay. Put the bong down, Rex. It, no, you came up with the word I was trying to think of earlier, the simulation. Yes, that's what makes me think of the simulation. Thank you very much. High elevation, folks. We're at high elevation. So that's really, really, that's my excuse. Um, the neutrinos themselves. So when you play a video game, you've got a joystick and you're like, and then there's the monitor and then there's the video game system. And some of the video games now are becoming so advanced, the simulations themselves, the programs, the algorithms, they're they're like, wait, I'm an algorithm? You mean I'm not real? I thought I was real. Well, you're real. You're just a real algorithm. But I can kind of see this wireless thing. I'm sensing wireless and, and playing a video game. And you've got the user, and then you've got the avatar in the machine. And with these neutrinos and the planets and everything as such, it just kind of reminds me of a, a microcosm of the macrocosm. And maybe if we decide to to go into this simulation, be a part of this system, this, this outline, the neutrinos themselves are like the connecting point back to the user, back to source. And so that's kind of cool. It is. It's it's incredible. The it is a a, a connector point. I I like to use the term connecting the dots, connecting the dots to form the bigger picture, right? Because it just looks like dots before you connect them and you reveal the picture. And that's exactly what human design has done for a lot of different um, uh, different philosophies that I've studied, different. I mean, I have a background in anthropology uh, because I love studying human beings. You know, that's just my that's my jam. But it's it didn't answer all of the questions. And I I noticed whenever I would ask questions when I was earning my degree to, you know, professors that I I absolutely adored and respected their point of view. 
they when they didn't have the answer or if I posited something that was maybe not necessarily provable or that that this might be the reason why or it wasn't provable yet, it was dismissed as malarkey, you know? And really, I think that we're moving into an it, we're moving into a new cycle of looking at these things differently. And I mean, if astrophysicists and quantum physicists and can be theoretical physicists and posit something prior to being able to prove it simply because they can provide an equation that simplifies as such. I think that having as many different experiences as we human beings are having in all of our walks of life can be considered valid as well. And moving into uh, th this next global cycle is going to have a circuitry that is geared more towards the individual. And you know, we've been in this, this cross of planning that has been very categorized, like, you know, specialized. This this person does this and this person does that. And everyone needs to stay in their lane. But it's moving into an age where we are going to need to empower ourselves, not farm it out to someone else who specializes. But we're going to need to empower ourselves with this knowledge if we're going to understand the nature of our own existence. What does it all mean? <laughs> <laughs> i had to create an awkward silence there for a second no i mean this is far out and on that note i would definitely be um surprised if over the next few years a lot of this information scientifically with cern and these experiments what you're talking about they're going to start to connect i want to hear more about like the 2027 transfer tell me more about that so i can pull up i think i've shown you this before the uh the global cycles table yeah i think so honestly it's it's really cool because in the the last i, I want to talk about supernovas and and we'll get to 2027 but like supernovas are really interesting because they are the death of a sun right whenever the sun's electromagnetic field becomes imbalanced uh, between that which it's emitting and the gravity that's pulling it uh, uh, similar to how we're seeing in the sunspots on our sun right now with all of the solar flare activity whenever it becomes too out of balance when it becomes unstable what what you get is a supernova and it's really interesting because the supernova before it ever happens, before there's anything visible, even with the best telescopes, before a supernova happens, what you get is a an extreme flush, a flooding of neutrinos stream. Like it, it gets surged, the, the neutrino stream. And then the supernova occurs. What's really interesting about the timeline of neutrinos is that the time that Ra Uruhu was visited by the mysterious voice and given the human design prophecy, this was in January of 1987. And then in February of 1987, the very next month, that is when we found supernova 1987A, and it was the first like really visible supernova in proximity to Earth since the year 1600, which was the last global cycle shift when we moved out of the cross of consciousness and into the cross of planning. That's pretty interesting. The dots are starting to connect, as you would say. Indeed, they do. They And they continue to connect, and they're going to keep connecting as we move through all of these different, I mean, I, I keep calling it a paradigm shift. I, anyone who is, is not seeing like all of the crazy changes that we're all experiencing simultaneously, you know, isn't really tuning in very well. Would you agree? They've got a lot going on. <laughs> they've, yeah, they're, they're definitely focused on other things, which I get it. I mean, there's a lot of people that they're so, they've got to focus on the grind. They've got to just focus on surviving and you know, when you're in that survive mode, that fight or flight mode, it's a lot more difficult to to study other aspects of things, unless for whatever reason that's taking you down a certain path that opens up your mind, and that's that's a whole other podcast. But 
we're, we're very fortunate that we can talk about this kind of stuff and share this information. And, and we have such a, a great group of people behind us as well that, that comment and, and watch the podcasts. And then, you know, like you work with a, a lot of people and I've, I've had several people reach out to me that have that found you through the project and they said, Hey, Jen's great. And so thank you for that. I think that it's going to, it might get kind of like the next few months could be very interesting. And if we can get through that, um, without a lot of opportunities uh, that might be considered negative by some, maybe we could like kind of jump several timelines in a sense, you know, um, take a shortcut through the jungle and then we make it to symbolically speaking, metaphorically speaking, Atlantis or I don't know, maybe people don't want Atlantis because Atlantis seems to have some technology that might link up to the singularity, but other people might say, hey, that sounds awesome, man. I can, you know, I can, I can, think about something and then boom it happens and um in a digital reality I mean, there's there's a lot of possibilities but then someone might want to be lemuria you know, there's like mm -hmm. dungeons and dragons not the most technology more of the way of the wizard i don't know it's it's definitely wild but it seems to all be kind of merging right now we now just so you know you're not sharing your screen with us when you were going to show us the timelines i wanted to ask you something about 1600 you brought up 1600 and that was a there was a shift in time there and a supernova Yes, there in in the year 1600 that was the last time when we obviously didn't have telescopes at available made available to us but we were able to observe a supernova that was recorded in uh, you know and we'd have to look up and see who recorded that but that was the last time that a supernova was visible from earth and that was very close to us. And if you, this, this is the table of the global cycles as, I mean, as was given, this was information given to Ra in a period of eight days and eight nights. And it was, it was very frightening. And he was, you know, this was something that was a part of his, um, part of his process of, you know, deconditioning from the world that he had left behind and integrating into the world that he had received as his as his new normal, right? But the, I mean, that was a catalyzing um, agent, if you will, to the voice visiting him. And I know a lot of people will disregard that as nonsense. Oh, well, you know, anyone can hear anything on mushrooms or or whatever, you know, and, and that it's probably the case, though, that it opened up avenues of, you know, d these neutrino streams, as well as crystals of consciousness, which we're not going to get into on this podcast. But I am going to be covering a masterclass on crystals of consciousness for all who are in enrolled in my membership. And that's going to be next month in September, because if you think about the filters that human bodies are. There is a lattice that is created at the time of birth and at the time before birth, when you're still in utero, that these neutrino streams can, it, it, that it serves as a filter for them to pass through and to be observed and integrated based on your unique aspect of consciousness. And for whatever reason, that was the phenomenon that took place for Ra when he received this information. And if you look down here at the very bottom uh, in the blue, the teal blue section, we're here in the cross of planning. And in the cross of consciousness ended in 1614 AD. And that's whenever the cross of planning began. And we're about to exit the cross of planning and move into the cross of the sleeping Phoenix right here in 2027. Let me see if I can. Ah, I was trying to zoom it in, but it won't let me. Yikes. There we go. Can you see it better now? Yeah, I was just looking. I was looking for the data um, on the like the the little excerpt about the cross of planning and then the excerpt about the sleeping phoenix oh like what characterizes each of these yeah okay let's see if i can pull something else up mm -hmm. hmm. this is from the jovian archive and this is where all of the information that was compiled from all of Ra uruhu's publications after receiving human design prophecy 
you can uh, you can explore human design in its entirety here um, and get a fundamental some fundamental concepts about it. But basically, these are all of the different gates. And this is an entire, I mean, this represents the entire cosmos, right? With the human being at the center of it all. And, you know, your natal chart can be found, it can be mapped, let's say, on this particular chart, which is kind of like, it's called a mandala chart. But also, as the, um, I, I believe Pluto is the determining factor because of it being an outlier in our system. And it is, it's known as like the planet of transformations as it, it, it will move like one degree over, like basically activating a different gate in Pluto at the time of each global shift. And so it's it's very um it's very in mathematical it's 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 very mapped out which is not always my bag like i it, it it helps to look at things for me but it's um as it moves the, like it basically as pluto moves into the different gates each one of those gates is transformed be and and it's a little bit different than it was before right and so once it has moved through all of the gates, it becomes a different cycle. It kind of like starts over at the very beginning. But basically, Ra Uruhu, I mean, one of my favorite quotes of his is that neutrinos possess an infinitesimally small amount of mass and they are manufactured in the stars. They are the byproducts of the stars. They are the exhaling breath of stars. And they go through everything, everywhere, all the time at the speed of light. This is the raw data that is, is flowing literally on a stream into our own fields of unique differentiation to be perceived and to be interpreted and to be experienced differently by each of our differentiated uniqueness in terms of consciousness, right? And, and we're experiencing it on a collective scale. That's deep. And I couldn't have said it better myself. And once again, it's just making me think of the, the God code, the universal code, and our minds being antennas and receivers, our bodies. And you brought the neutrinos earlier in the way that it interacts with DNA. I wonder if it actually creates the oscillation of the DNA and it and sends the information back. So information comes to us and then it gets sent back. Um, so cool. This is really fascinating. And I'm gonna I'm gonna dive deep into the neutrinos myself now. I feel like this is a whole new world of opportunities for us. Absolutely. It absolutely does relate and connect the dots with our, our DNA codes as well. Um, there are DNA biologists that, you know, many of them received this testimony from Ra at very synchronistic times whenever he was unrolling it and introducing it to the world. And many of them left their fields of interest where they were at that time. And they have moved into this trajectory of human design studies. And what's amazing is that they are relating and finding those connections between their previous work and how it interlocks so seamlessly with human design. And that's why I'll be a lifelong student of human design, Rex. There's never going to be some, like I, I'm always going to have something new to discover about it because it touches literally everything about our existence and our world. Well, keep, keep me posted and let's do another follow-up in a few months and maybe you can share some new information with us. That'd be great. I'd love to. Thank you for having me, Rex. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, and also, so I know there's going to be a lot of people that are going to want to take your course. And I, I don't know how many spots you have left, but could you give some information about that? So when people are interested. I'd love to. Yes. Okay, cool. So I'm moving away from doing readings and individual master classes because I really feel like those who are interested in learning, they need to start connecting these dots for themselves and taking that self-empowered step 
to, you know, certainly ask questions in a community of others who are interested in it themselves, because it really is the perspectives of all interlocked together that shines the light on the truth and the, you know, everything that we're seeking with this knowledge. And so I have 10 spots available for the founding members of my brand new membership. I just unrolled it this week. It's called Human Design Connections. And I have 10 spots for founding members who are going to help me build this community and this fellowship of human design discovery and to be able to relate it to their own life of relationships, of business. I mean, the list goes on and on. However, it is you want to apply this knowledge in your own walk you know, that's only going to up level the rest of our collective. So I'd love it if anyone who is interested in joining my uh, my human design connections, I'll share a screen right here and you can grab that link, hopefully in the comments or the description of the video. Yeah, for, for 10 founding members, I'm holding spots open to join Human Design Connections with me. That's going to give you access to that monthly. It's it's not going to necessarily always be a masterclass, but it will be live with me once a month. I might have a guest speaker in their own field of expertise and how they relate human design to the work that they do. It might be a masterclass or a challenge. We're always going to have access as in, in this membership to the community that I have in Telegram to ask questions about your chart and then to take that knowledge of human design and apply it to your human life. And there's also an entire library that I'm building right now as we speak with human design foundations to understand the basic framework of this system, what was shared to Ra Uruhu at the time of its delivery by the mysterious voice, what has been corroborated by science, what is apparent in our human history and how it relates to our evolution as, as a, a species. Because we are in a transitory state here right now. I mean, we can look at who we were, you know, 400 years ago and see big changes that have taken place to where we're at right now. And we can see future trajectories of potential of what is possible and likely of, of what it is that we're going to become in the future with the emergence of AI and this age of the internet. And, you know, these are all revelations that are going to be shared intimately within our community, Human Design Connections. And I would love it if anybody is is feeling the pull, feeling that intuitive uh, urge to join up as a founding member. I'm holding 10 spots available for $27 a month, and that's pricing locked in for life. All right. Well, there. that's pretty awesome. Thanks. I appreciate that very much. And thank you for offering our uh, amazing listeners an opportunity to be a part of the incredible programs you do. So cool. Oh, I'm always connected to amazing souls whenever I get to sink in with your orbit, Rex. It's always a gift. Thank you so much for the opportunity and for just connecting the dots for us all in all of the work that you do on Link Project. It's an honor and my pleasure. And James, well, to see you.